Welcome back to the Passion and Persistence Podcast. I'm your host, Elena Mitchell, and this podcast is dedicated to reminding you that with passion and persistence, anything is possible. So let's push through this together. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Passion and Persistence Podcast. I'm your host, Elena Mitchell, and today I have Jesse DeLillo here to talk about real estate, multifamily real estate, and how to create passive income with that. But more than that, you already know we're going to be diving deeper into his passion and finding little nuggets of gold to help you along the way. So without further ado, here is Jesse DeLillo. Hi, Elena. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really glad we can finally connect in this format. Yeah, we've been trying to do this for a while now. So it's nice to, to be on here and, and get to do this with you. Yeah. So I wanted to hear out of your mouth, what is it that you do or love to do? Um, so real estate has been a passion of mine since I was younger, but uh, it all started actually on a hockey trip. I had always done little side jobs with my brother, like Breaking leaves, shoveling gra- uh, snow, mowing grass, all those things, um, anything really to to make a buck. Uh, my parents had in- infused that in us early that, you know, we had to go out and work hard for our money. So um, I saw that real estate was a way that we didn't have to be as active um, just from this infomercial on a, you know, at a hotel trip when I was like 16 years old. And um I convinced my parents to start an LLC and we started actually doing that business, which was tax lien investing Um, throughout the years that evolved into wholesaling and then flipping houses and turnkey rentals, out of state stuff, Airbnbs, luxury flips. And we eventually finally stumbled into uh, multifamily and self storage. Uh, And now the real estate fund space is where uh, we're headed to next. So there's been a lot of different steps that we've done to get there, but it all really came um, from just seeing this infomercial and kind of opening my eyes that, you know, it's it's not as challenging to make as much money as people think it is. Um, it's not, not that it's easy by any means, but there's other avenues to work besides, you know, grinding into the ground, working two or three jobs, you know, nine to five, plus your five to nine, plus whatever you do in the sign. Like you don't have to necessarily do that. And especially for your entire life, just to get by. Um, and I saw that, you know, my, my father, unfortunately, he passed in, uh, 2017, but he was only 59 when he passed and he worked, you know, multiple jobs his whole life to, you know, keep food on the table and, you know, make sure that we didn't want for anything. So, um, I did not, after he passed, I, I really had this realization that that's not what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, I don't want to be sitting at a corporate job, going to something that I hate doing. Um, I want to just continue to follow my passions and work on things that, uh, just, We'll, we'll give my time back, you know, buying our time back, I think is the most important thing. Um, Cause it's, that's our, you know, our limited supply is, is time. We don't know when the end is and we all know it's coming eventually. So um, the sooner that we can kind of get out of that rat race, um, the, the more time you'll be able to do with, um, you know, do things that you want to do, uh, follow your passions, follow your dreams, um, help as many people as possible. And I've really enjoyed this migration into um, some of the mentoring space, uh, I've been able to help a few people get into the space. And then, you know, eventually I'll be, uh, hopefully just doing some coaching on the side while my real estate works for itself. So. Yeah, exactly. And I love your mindset of creating that passive income from such a young age. I think we all were taught that you have to work hard to get far in life. And I think that's a big misconception in the world. It, It is life is exactly what you believe it is. If you think you have to work hard, you're going to be working hard, grinding for such a little return. And so you learned at a young age that you don't have to work hard to really get the life that you want. And then knowing from such a young age that you could put the pieces together to create this passive income is so inspiring. So how old were you when all of this kind of started to unfold when you kind of asked your family to start this business with you or how did it unfold? So the first one we started when I was, uh, when I was 16, um, that was the, that was the first company I would do a lot of the research. My dad would fly down to the auctions. Uh, we'd go look at the, um, the properties that we were going to pay. We were pretty much paying people's taxes for them. Um, and you get an interest rate on that. And eventually you redeem that for the property. If they don't pay you back, um, we weren't doing homes. We did vacant land. We figured most people just, if they weren't paying their bills already, they likely didn't want to pay, you know, anything else for that land. So that was kind of our business strategy. I never really wanted to take somebody out of their home because they didn't pay a tax bill. That just wasn't, it just didn't feel right to me. Um, 
the land, you know, was a little less emotional and it's just, uh, we wound up selling most of those off to developers anyway, um, who built homes for people, you know, that should have probably been there originally. Yeah, exactly. Putting good use to the land. I really, really love that. And so do you feel like this is all working in your passion and what is passion to you? I think my passion really is to help people um, and serve people at the highest level. And I think that our, everyone's biggest stress in life, at least 99% of the population is money. Um, and if we can show people that you don't have to work for every dollar that you make, um, there's tremendous tax benefits. There's uh, the ability to create these passive income streams that just will never go away and you can pass from generation to generation and the next generation doesn't have to work as hard. You know, there's a lot of freedom when it comes to like money that comes in that you don't work for. When the first of the month hits and, you know, our Airbnb pays out and our um, our other rentals pay out and the rent on the multifamily properties and the self-storage facilities and all that rent hits the bank account, you start to realize, wow, you know, I'm not working for this money. I've already done all of the work, you know, we're still asset managing and managing managers, but at the end of the day, we're not, we're not physically out there. Like I'm not out there digging holes, you know, um, like I was with the, with the uh, utility company prior to doing this full time, you know, I'm not out there in the field. I'm not stressing about getting up at four in the morning to go to work, to go to a job site, to get yelled at by, you know, 30 different inspectors. Like now I get to set my own timeline. I have my own freedom and I can try to help people get to the same point that I am. Exactly. That passive recurring income is what every entrepreneur dreams of. And so you mentioned that you had always wanted to be an entrepreneur. What led you to that desire? And how old were you when you knew you wanted to be an entrepreneur? So it really started when I was younger. Um, I wanted things that my parents couldn't like buy for me at the time. Um, they just didn't have the ability and they weren't just going to throw money at something, you know, to, because we wanted it. Right. Um, they said, just go out and work for it. So my brother had uh, my, my oldest brother is five years older than me. Um, he always had a bunch of different hustles going on. Like it started with like selling candy and stuff at school. Um, he would sell blow pops and airheads. And then I kind of migrated into that business. Um, I would, I was always like his little helper whenever we would go places. So we, I would be the person who would like knock on your door. Hey, do you want me to shovel your driveway or rake your leaves? And then, you know, my brother would come in with like a snowblower and we would get to get most of the job done. But, you know, it was like that, that instilled the, that like sales, um, I guess the sales, I don't know the word. Drive or. Drive, yeah. Yeah. yeah it, kinda, it, it brought that, um, it brought that into fruition like early and I really enjoyed that. I liked talking to people. Um, and even that that's helping people, you know, yeah, we're little kids, but they don't want to shovel their driveway. They didn't want to rake all their leaves. They didn't want to bag them up and do all like we, we were happy to do it. And, you know, to make that little bit of money to do, it was perfect. So I saw that I was able to do things that my friends weren't able to do. I was able to buy things that, you know, other people weren't able to buy. Um, I was able to buy like, for example, hockey goalie gear is super expensive and my parents couldn't afford to pay, you know, all for, for all of that. So we would split that as I was growing up um, because I had money to pay for it. And it was, you know, when I even when I got my first W2 job working at Wendy's, uh, I was 14 years old. Like I immediately started working as many hours as I can to make money so that eventually I didn't have to do that forever. Uh, but I've always wanted to work. I've always wanted to, you know, build build up income. And then it wasn't really until we learned about investing that you can use all of that income that you earn to earn passive income. And that's where really this, this big light bulb uh, switched in our head. And it was like, you know, I'm never doing any of these other things again. I'm just going to focus on let's build this nest egg, invest it, and then do the same thing over and over again. Exactly. And I relate so much to your upbringing and story. And I feel like you can just see the little entrepreneurs at a really young age by the ones that are doing all those things. I too sold candy in high school. I too pulled people's weeds out of their yard or mowed it. You know what I mean? I sold avocados on the side of the road. So you just oh, know God. that it's in your soul from a very young age. I feel like any entrepreneur listening to this right now probably has done one or two things we both mentioned, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's like the, the basic you know, I think you see it as a at a young at a young person though, because the the school system might ne necessarily be fitting the you know you might not fit into this mold of going out and being an employee. Um, that's just not exactly what I wanted to do. I mean, I had a great job out of college, uh, but I quit that job to flip houses full time. You know, after that, and then 
you know, obviously migrating eventually into the multifamily space, which is really investing instead of flipping. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I had a um, close to a six figure job in California that I just walked away from uh, to, to pursue this full time. I just couldn't do, I couldn't do that anymore. I couldn't be, they were going to transfer me up to Northern California to start a whole nother thing again. And I was just done. Um, that, that corporate life was just not for me. It wasn't yeah. something I had any passion about. Um, it was like, if you're dragging ass to get out of bed every morning, like I don't, I don't want to do that. So that's it another made the very shift. common denominator of entrepreneurs is they don't want to be told what to do. They don't want to run on someone else's schedule. They usually quit jobs very often because they don't want to be stuck in that rat race. And so anybody listening to this right now, if you're questioning your journey as an entrepreneur, like, should I be doing this? Was I made for this? If you fit into this mold of like, you don't want to be in that hamster wheel or you were an entrepreneur since you were a kid, you're definitely meant to be doing this. Do not give up because it's ingrained in your DNA. And I love that about learning about people's childhood because you learn so much about who they will be. And so you mentioned a little bit about the school system. Did you go to a traditional school or what was your schooling like? Yeah, I went to a traditional school um, okay. all the way, you know, all the way through senior year. Uh, but it was when I even went, even went to you know college for four years, uh, but I really went to college to play hockey. And then I found I wound up falling in love with the actual school in the area um, and I got a little bit more passionate about the the subject of it, sustainability. So, you know, and more environmental focused. That's eventually, you know, the goal of, of our company is to um, provide affordable housing to people that need housing uh, that's sustainable. So not only built with, you know, green products using green energy, but long lived products that safe, chemical free homes, like really a place that people can go and um feel healthy and and get better and hopefully eventually be able to move out and leave that home for somebody else. So um, that would be long term down the line. But in the meantime, you know, we're, we're focusing on helping other people reach that passive investment um, space and get into those multiple streams of income where they can, you know, release themselves from that nine to five eventually. Exactly. But I love that little pieces to your journey are fueling to the bigger picture of where you want to go. So a lot of entrepreneurs are against college, but you got a piece to your puzzle from that experience of college, right? And yeah, that's yeah. not going to lead to the bigger picture of what's to come. So it's not always the end all be all to go to college, but any part of your journey usually adds to the bigger picture of where it all leads. So Absolutely. that's really, really cool. I love your story. It's so inspiring. So you're from a family of just a brother, mom and dad, or what's your family dynamic like? Um, so I have two brothers and a sister. I'm the youngest. Uh, my sister's the oldest. Uh, she has, uh, she has two kids. They're 13 and 14 right now. So, you know, they're, they're in high, they're getting into high school and uh, it's cool to see them, you know, grow up and then eventually, you know, I'll be having kids. So um, they'll be, uh, they'll have some pretty older, older cousins there, but uh, you know, I'm excited. I'm excited about all of this because I, I'm excited to show my family eventually that this is, you know, there is another way you don't have to go to college and you don't have to, you know, worry about school. Cause like my, my one brother that moved here to Milwaukee with me, he's, probably been to five different colleges and jumps around to different things before he started his own business. You know, it was just like that, that role, that route was just not for him. And, um, you know, we don't really realize it until you're doing something that you hate, uh, that you're like, wow, there's probably a better way. And there has to be a different spot that I can do other things in. Yeah. And Ed Milet talks a lot about the one in the family that kind of changes the trajectory or the cycles the family has been stuck in. And I feel like every entrepreneur that steps outside of those bounds and wakes their family up is literally changing hundreds of lives to come because you're getting your whole family out of that cycle into a whole new understanding of what life could be. That's the coolest part. That's what it's all about. And so my question to you is, what's your ultimate why? What's the reason behind this drive? And I'm sensing it's probably legacy for your family. But it, it really you. is. <laughs> that's 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 mainly what it was. So um, when my dad passed, my mom didn't have much money um, to live on. So she was working as a special ed aide at school. Um, that is not a very high paying job. Uh, my father did not have a big life insurance policy. So she pretty much had a, under $100,000 to figure out how to live the rest of her life. And my passion then became, how do I help my mom become stable? 
Um, so that was the house living business. I left my job to do that full time so that we could build up uh, the wealth that way. And what we realized from flipping houses is that's a job. It's I just traded in my nine to five that I hated for another job that wasn't as great. Um, but it, it did produce, you know, it produced a lot of income, uh, but it also produces a lot of tax liability and it's not passive. Um, That's that headache money. I was just listening to Master yeah. P on another podcast. He said, I don't want no headache money. And that's exactly yeah. what that was. <laughs> yeah, running like four or five projects at a time, um, having different investors and different contractors and designers and the whole thing. It, it was a nightmare. Uh, it's a project management nightmare. And um, luckily enough, during COVID, we discovered the other, you know, the other side of real estate, the actual passive side of real estate. Right. Interesting. So COVID was kind of like a catalyst for you to shift gears a little bit more towards the bigger picture that you were always imagining. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because we, um, I, had, I had gone to Grant Cardone's uh, real estate summit, and he just did an equation up on the board. And it was um, raising the rent uh, across like a 500 unit portfolio, $300. And it produced like $30 million tax free um, of value. And I was like, what? $30 million? Like, how many houses do I have to flip to make $30 million? And I did the math and I have to flip a thousand houses if I'm making about 30,000 a house. So if it takes me months, you know, several months to flip one, how, how many years is it going to take me to flip a thousand? And just by that math, I called my mom. We went out into the hallway at the conference. I called my mom and I said, we're never flipping a house again. And we stopped flipping houses that day on and only focused on this. Wow, I love that. But you would have never known what the bigger picture was without all of the math and the equation to put it all together. That's I love those kinds of summits and conventions, especially with Grant Cardone, because it just opens your eyes to the small pieces of the puzzle we've kind of been missing, right? Did you network at that event? Like, did you meet anyone else on your journey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually met my business partner, Sean, on that uh, at that event. And my other business partner, Jim, I met at another one of those. So the guys that were launching our fund, uh, our fund and our nonprofit for uh, um, those guys, I met at those summits. So that was really, it's really cool. That's really, really cool. And so if somebody listening right now is questioning what to do next to get to the level that you're at or the understanding and knowledge you have of real estate or passive income, what would your advice be? Um. I would go to real estate summits. I would go to different conferences. I'd go to different events. I would join Facebook groups and go to different meetups. I mean, every market has a meetup for some sort of real estate, whether that's single family or multifamily. Um, there's a bunch of different meetups around the country. I mean, I just relocated from um, San Diego to Milwaukee. And here in Milwaukee, there was not a multifamily meetup group, but in four or five cities around us within an hour drive, there was. So uh, we're likely going to start one here in Milwaukee, specifically for multifamily. But in the meantime, we're still going to the single family ones and connecting with people who have a passion to get into multifamily. And now we're able to show them the, you know, the right the right steps to take and what mentorship groups to join and different conferences to go to. So we're able to help people that are wanting to get here, but just have no idea. Uh, so that's a cool thing that we're able to do. Uh, but for everyone else, like if you have no experience in real estate, just go to meetups. They're free. Uh, meetups are free. Facebook groups are free. You know, there's so many things that you can do for free. Watch YouTube, watch Grant's videos on YouTube. You know, you don't have to spend uh, $5,000 to go to a conference. Um, he speaks about most of the same things for free on YouTube. You know, the point of the conferences is to network, uh, meet people, meet potential partners, potential investors. Um, obviously, learning there is great. But if you go there with a little knowledge already, it makes it a lot easier to understand. Exactly, exactly. And take notes and talk to people and seek the information that you're looking for that's missing to your puzzle. That's so, so important and valuable. So it seems like you have your head on your shoulders and you're kind of young. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 32. Okay. Okay. You look really young. So sorry. We'll cut that part cool. out of the episode. You look like that's, you're 25. Anyway. That's cool. I'll stick with that. Yeah, I'm 25. <laughs> we'll use that for a blooper part. Um, so yeah, you seem like you have your head on your shoulder. So do you have a daily routine that you follow or something that kind of helps you stay focused? Um, so right now I I did the I was I was doing those miracle mornings and um that just wasn't for me. I I wasn't as passionate about it. And 
because I wasn't passionate about it, I didn't follow through with it. Um, I wake up in the morning, I check through, I usually check through real estate deals that come to my phone overnight. Um, I know it's not traditional. A lot of people like to wake up and meditate and then exercise and do all of those things. My routine is like, let me get up. I'm going to look at deals, respond to like the most important things of the day. I like to get that done. And then I'll have breakfast or exercise and then start the rest of my day, uh, which is usually uh, speaking to investors. Um, you know, I have a couple other businesses outside of real estate. So there's, you know, multiple things going on all the time. I don't necessarily have that morning routine down pat, but eventually uh, when we have when we have more passive income and we're not hustling still as much, um, that's when I think we I would get into a better routine. But for now, it's like okay, yeah, I and wake up, check those, check the notifications because there is a, some important things that I can handle right away in the morning. You know, if I can get back to somebody at six thirty seven in the morning and then not have to have that hanging over my head the rest of the day. Um, I don't remember if that was Ed who had mentioned that. I was just going to say that he says get the hard things done. Quick. Yeah, thing. I mean he he starts his day with like. You know, he hydrates and then he exercises and meditates and reads and then he does the hard stuff. I like open my eyes, figure out the hard stuff, get that done and then, you know, get on with the rest of the day. Yeah, I think it's important to know what works for us. All of us as entrepreneurs or anyone listening has probably compared themselves or their routine to someone they're following online or something they heard on a podcast. But who knows if people are really sticking to those routines, first of all. Yeah. Second of all, we're all human. And third of all, we're all so different. So not every formula works for everybody. I remember I was on a podcast probably three or four years ago now, and someone asked me what my routine was. And it was really just so simple. <laughs> And I remember thinking to myself, was that the wrong answer? But no, that was my routine. Like, that's what worked for me at that time. Part of that routine was driving through the neighborhoods, looking at murals in the morning. Oh, cool. That's nice. <laughs> because for me, that inspired me for the rest of yeah. my day, you know, because I'm in a creative field. But to the people listening on that podcast, they're probably like, what? She drives around in circles. <laughs> <laughs> what a weird, what a weird lady. <laughs> <laughs> whatever works for you. I think the listeners yeah. should definitely remember that. Like, don't beat yourself up for being a human at the end no. of the day. Um, so <laughs> what, what's your end goal? Like, when are you going to stop the hustle and the grind or the, the building? Like, what's it for you? Um, I think more, it's not about like a number or like a timeline. I just, when I get to the point where I don't have to ever look at my bank account again, I know I can stop. Um, yes. And that's going to be like when we have different trust structured and, you know, a, a generational wealth pipeline built. Um, yes. So whenever I reach that point, and that could be, you know, I've, I've set big goals at different points in my career. Like last year, we wanted to buy a thousand units and we were able to pick up 1300 units in 13 months. You know, I didn't reach it in the year, but we reached it in 13 months. So like, I like to put out big goals like that, but this year we're focusing on building our two funds. Um, we're raising over $60 million between those. So that's a lot of work and passion and whether that gets done in six months, um, a year, two years, however long it takes us, like that's really what I'm focusing on now. Uh, and then beyond that, it's going to be fun too for each one of those. So it's, you know, we're going to keep going out, investing in deals, raising money, meeting new syndicators, other groups that we could partner with and just build more relationships and build more passive income. Um, I, I kind of enjoy this as more of like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's almost like a sport, you know, when you can, you go through all of the steps and you train for months and you go through all of, you know, the due diligence and put your plans together and then uh, building your investors and getting everyone into the team and getting everyone on board with the business plan. And it's like, it's, it's fun. It, it's like it's like playing Monopoly, but in real life. Um, and Monopoly was always my favorite game as a kid. I'll see another clue to who you would become. But you're right. It's hard to stop when you really are passionate about it. That's why I truly believe passion and persistence, those two combined, they're unbeatable, unstoppable, because you'll never stop when you're passionate, right? And the passion isn't so much the real estate. It's the chase of the knowledge and putting the knowledge in place to build a legacy for your family and to absolutely and having to not worry about your bank account like you said so let's talk a little bit about money because i don't come from much money and once i started making more money that was really scary for me for many reasons and i wasn't always good with managing money have you faced anything like that on your journey as well 
Yeah, I um, I prematurely quit my job. Um, I should have <laughs> I should have taken the job, you know, in NorCal and and went out there for at least six months and saved. Okay. Um, I thought, oh, you know, I'm just going to go flip more houses, and you know, then we hit a lull where we didn't sell a house for six months, mm-hmm. um, so I didn't get paid for six months. Um, so that was pretty terrible money management at that point. Like living on credit cards while getting houses flipped was not really ideal. <laughs> You know, there's, there's, uh, we made a couple of mistakes in business, uh, trusting people, handshake agreements where, you know, they ran away with our money and, uh, we've had partners steal from us that, you know, obviously are no longer in the picture, um, contractors that were, you know, massive lawsuit against. And so there's, there's, you know, mistakes that we've made with money. Um, and it really came down to trusting that everyone was on the, had the same moral compass that we did. Um, you know, and that, that wound up, you know, it just costs us more money now because now we have to go, we have to go into relationships more protected. Um, we can't just go in and partner with somebody. Now we have to get the legal people involved and, you know, attorney's fees are expensive. So we, we didn't necessarily have the best attorney when we started it. You know, we were just going with cookie cutter documents and we should have had more, you know, people reviewing those, but you know, it is what it is. Money. Money ebbs and flows. And I think if you have a really, uh, you can always, I don't remember who said this, but it was an entrepreneur I heard on a podcast and they said, you could always make more money. And I think that that sticks with me as like, you know, we had, we had a um, contractor who stole several hundred thousand dollars um, throughout the course of COVID while we weren't out there physically able to look at properties. And, um, you know, at the end of the day that came out of my pocket, I paid my investors back out of my money and then I was left back at zero to restart, but same thing. I could always make more money. So we find a way to, to get through. And I think um, you, a lot of people are going to make mistakes, no matter how much training you have about finance and investing and all of these things, like we're all going to make money mistakes along the way. So don't beat yourself up because you can always make more money. Exactly. I love that advice, leaving it off with some hope because yeah, what you believe is always going to be true. And if you believe you can make it again, of course, you're going to make it again, without a doubt. Um, But I think that a lot of entrepreneurs, especially when you come from a little bit of less, like I come from a really low income family, I think the money's a little bit of a scary topic. And then when you start to make it, it's really important to have that optimism of being able to learn by losing it a little bit, because that's actually the best way to learn to save it is by losing it, right? Yeah. And also all the hard lessons that we go through on this journey of entrepreneurship, all the fails, that's the best way to hold on to that lesson is by it hurting so bad that you'll never let that happen again. You know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so you just have to be thankful for all the ebbs and flows and hard hits. To I, I think another thing is like coming from, you know, not, not a well affluent family as well, like money has always been like a goal instead of like a tool. And what you what? learn from wealthy people is money is just a tool. Money oh, is yeah. not ever a goal. And there's a lot of entrepreneurs that start this and they go, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go well, make a million dollars. It's like, okay, well, then what do you do with the million dollars? Like, That's cool. what's the point? What's the point of the money? Everybody should rewind this and replay that three times for themselves, especially replay it before you go to sleep, because that is so valuable, what you just said. And realizing, too, we set the bar so low when you don't even realize what good money is, in my opinion. Like, for instance, there are people that think making 75K a year is amazing money. That's such a low bar that society has set on us. You know what I'm saying? Like, Absolutely. And then when you're making the good money, you're like, wow, this isn't even really good money. I still need more. And so we've just been conditioned to set that bar way too low with money in general, I believe. Absolutely. I think so, too, because, I, you know, a lot of us go through the traditional route of school and then you get a job and it's like, oh, you're earning six figures already. Like, that's amazing. And then it's like, you know, we, we close a, we close a real estate deal and we know in in three years, we're going to refinance that deal and pull out $30 million. Like the way bigger that's like you know six million a year if you think about it right so there's just we see these numbers and it's like holy crap you know i've been thinking so small my whole life because i've been conditioned my whole life to think that you know i we shouldn't talk about money money is like a taboo thing i'm like i talk about money with all of my friends and the friends that i don't talk about money with like i usually you know we don't wind up being friends that long i mean it's it's just like 
everyone's mindset's different, but you know, at the end of the day, there's money is of abundance and they keep printing it. So there's always going to be more. So like you can go out and make as much as you possibly could imagine making. All you have to do is find the avenue and then put in the work. Yeah. As much as you can imagine and then some because yeah, imaginations tend to be capped. Um, so yeah, I love that advice. And the last thing that I want to touch a little bit on is what are your core beliefs that get you through the harder times? Because entrepreneurship is gut wrenching hard for so many people that are going to be listening to this now or in the future, and maybe they want to give up and they need something to pull them through. What is it that you turn to in those times of need or pain or whatever? Um, whenever things are bad, I always remember that things could get worse. You know, I have, I have a roof over my head. I have food on the table. You know, I have a comfortable bed to sleep in. Like I don't live in my car. I'm not homeless. You know, there's a lot more people like that are much, much more uh, worse off than we are. You know, there's, there's little kids that don't eat for a week at a time um, around the world. And like, I think if you humble yourself and you realize that like, you're, you're going to be okay, regardless of where you are, what happened, you know, how much money you've lost or whatever happened, you know, in your life, everything can always get better tomorrow. You know, you're going to wake up and you have a whole new, another chance to, you know, change, change yourself and change your position, change your status, whatever that is. Um, you, as long as you wake up in the next morning, you should be thankful. Yes. Gratitude is like a magical molecule released throughout your body. And science actually proves that when you have gratitude, even in those hard times, it propels you to get up again and chase again through the gratitude. And even from a spiritual perspective, gratitude and gratitude and faith is what gets a lot of people through. Uh, are you spirit? You mentioned you were spiritual a little bit. Tell me a little bit about that. Do you meditate, pray? What's your spirituality like? Um, so I was raised Catholic. I went to um, Catholic school for a few years there. Uh, I was did the communion confirmation thing. Uh, that's just, I'm not as passionate about like that one, you know, how do I put this? I would say that I, I believe that there's a higher power. I just don't necessarily believe that we have to call it that one person or, you know, that it's one man. And that's projected, like, especially in, you know, society here like jesus is this white man you know that it's like that's not even there's science and then there's religion and then there's like when you realize that there's so many other books and things in the vatican that are not released and you know this is the version they came up with now and that this is what we go by it's like all right this is a bunch of people in a room getting together and, and filling out whatever you know religious thing that they're doing yes. um not that I don't believe in God. I think there is a higher power. I don't know if his name is God, Jesus, Allah, you know, whatever higher spirit it is, but there is energy. There is a spiritual world out there. And that's what I believe in. And you feel it. Do you feel and it? You feel it. Absolutely. I think Absolutely. that's the one thing nobody can deny because anybody listening right now may have different spiritual beliefs and we don't want to step on anyone's toes or make anybody feel uncomfortable by talking about this. But I think it's important that we all are comfortable with voicing what we believe in when it comes to that to find common understandings. Because I too believe like you believe it's hard to believe everything written in the Bible, knowing how flawed man is and how many times it's been mm -hmm. retranslated and how man controls narratives to get their own things done done you know what i'm saying so it's i completely relate with what you're saying but i can't deny the feelings i get from god 100 percent. whatever anyone wants to put the name or title to you know what i'm saying so yeah. i totally relate with that um, yeah so they, there's definitely something there it's just yeah <laughs> what their name is or who they are whether they're you know a person a being whatever that is like we don't know and we'll never know until we die so that's my belief and um you know i like to believe that there's there and i can feel you know, different energies, but at the end of the day, I don't have to follow, you know, this specific guideline that they lay out. Right. But do you seek answers? Do you seek guidance? Do you call out to anything? Like, how do you work through that in life? I, I honestly, I pray to, um, I pray to like my grandparents, my father, you know, people that oh. I know that have passed on, like oh, to help that. guide me through, through different things. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not necessarily like, I'm not going to go to church every Sunday. That's just right. not like me. Right, right, right. No, I totally understand that. And I'm sure a lot of listeners can relate to that as well. Well, like if you look at even the story of Jesus, Jesus didn't preach at a church. You know, he didn't have this 
several million dollar building with a gold tabernacle like he was in the street talking to people you know that's so like why why does it have to be this extreme you know version and and that's what i don't love Yes. And unfortunately, sometimes when you walk into churches, from my own personal experience, it's not always as welcoming. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, who's that coming into our, we know yeah. all these faces and that's a new one. That's how I feel sometimes when I come into a church. So um, no, I totally relate to all of that. And I've always said as well, growing up that you don't have to step foot into a church or open a Bible to know God or to have a connection with that higher power, or you don't have to memorize all the scriptures or know all the story. You know what I'm saying? Like you can yeah feel and get guidance and answers without all the extra details. So I totally relate with what you believe on that. Um, so to anybody listening right now that might want to get into real estate, we talk, talked a little bit about this, going to seminars, looking up information online. Was there any one specific resource that you felt like gave you the most value that they should look into? Um, it was really the mentorship with Cardone that changed the trajectory of our entire life. Um, because we saw that, you know, obviously that equation changed everything when we saw like, Oh my gosh, you can make so much more money doing it this way. But having somebody that can guide you through each one of those steps to get there um, is important. So I would say anybody who's really passionate about doing this and wants to do it full time, get a mentor who's already in the space, who's already doing what you want to do. Um, I would skip the small stuff, you know, even though that's what we're kind of shown is like, oh, you can buy a house. I would skip that. Um, I would buy something with multiple units, uh, at least two to three units. So you could do that house hacking method where you buy a duplex or a triplex and you let the other two tenants pay down your, um, your mortgage and then you pretty much live for free. That gets you kind of the feeling of uh, being an investor without actually going out and doing a bunch of things. Um, but if you have a good mentor that can help you get into a different space, like commercial real estate is where the most money is made. It's where real wealth is preserved and it's where passive income thrives. So I would look at larger things, um, add a zero to any number that you're comfortable with, and then just like keep adding zeros. So that's <laughs> like we started, we started with really small deals. I mean, they were $10,000 or less. Um, those tax lien properties, like some of them were like 800 bucks, you know, it wasn't a lot of money, but we kind of saw how it worked. And then when we moved into flipping, you know, we were buying houses, like our first few houses were like 17,000, 10,000, 15,000, like they weren't expensive houses. Um, but we learned different things from all those projects and now eventually we're able to get to this space. But if I could go back, I honestly would have skipped those, you know, five to seven years of, of full run into the small stuff and just done the bigger things. I learned great lessons there, but to be honest, like if I knew that this was really where, you know, generational wealth was created, that's where I would have started first. Exactly. I love that. And I'm sure a lot of people listening are going to find so much value in that advice. So where can they follow you to find more information about what you teach and how you can help? Uh, so you can follow me on social media. I'm at invest with JSJ. Or you just search my name, Jesse Delillo. There's only one of me, luckily. Um, there is a bunch of fake accounts that I keep reporting, but <laughs> trying my best to keep up with those. Uh, but I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn, um, either Jesse Delillo or at Invest with JSJ, or they can call or text me at 619-724-4446. Um, most people don't call or text, so I still share my phone number. <laughs> I love that. I have my phone number on my website, actually. That's so cool. Yeah, nobody, nobody, you know, not that many people call. Some people do. But... Some people do. Some people... <laughs> I've gotten some texts about, like, weird feet things. and like. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's weird people on the internet. <laughs> Yeah, but I love that you share your number. Um, Bradley does that a lot too. He's like, I want to make money and connect with people. So I'm going to share my number. That's very important. Um, wow, this was so much value. And I really relate to so much of what you said. So thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for taking time with us today. Thank you, Elena. I appreciate you having me on here. This was really fun. It was nice to get on a different podcast. It wasn't just real estate. Yeah, definitely. It was nice to learn more about your story. And I know so many people are going to relate and learn from you, even moving forward. Everybody go and follow Jesse DeLillo. I'm going to make sure to put his tag on the screen and all the information will be in the show notes of this show so that you can follow him, check out his website and all of the other information that he has for you. So thank you, Jesse, for being here. I will talk to you soon. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Passion and Persistence podcast. 
I'm your host, Elena Mitchell. This is Jesse DeLillo, and we will talk to you soon.